Your friends are scrolling through short content, but you, my friend, you're here to learn. Welcome to the RS Clips. Uh, the Modi government's focus is on infrastructure and mm -hmm. is probably going to be on infrastructure until the infrastructure is completely set, yeah. which is possibly after maybe one or two more terms. Mm -hmm. That's how long it takes to build out a country mm -hmm. as large as India yeah. with the kind of population we have. Yeah. Uh, I remember in the last one, I also asked you, other than infrastructure, what is being focused on? Yes. We spoke on manufacturing. Correct. Uh, because basically, when you help the world of manufacturing in any country, you give rise to a lot of jobs. Yeah. You stabilize the economy because Correct. people have predictable incomes, etc. You increase exports. Correct. So, you know, uh, I would want to, for, for, you know, our viewers here on manufacturing, sure. um, because there is a lot of debate on this, and especially, for instance, this idea, um, you know, which which I was involved in, the, the PLI scheme, for instance. So I want to explain to our viewers, you know, see, in 1991, we liberalized the economy. But when it comes to, you know, enabling or empowering our manufacturing sector per firms, Policy really did not do very much. And allow me to explain this as well. You mean so, since 1990 till now? 19, till, 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 you know, recently, and you know, uh, uh, till the uh, sort of th this government came into power. Um, okay. So uh, uh, let me explain this because think about a manufacturing firm, you know, what are the costs that it has? It actually, manufacturing firm uses power. A manufacturing firm needs labor, needs land, it needs to actually transport whatever it produces. And it also needs to actually, you know, spread its fixed costs over a large denominator, what we econ economists call economies of scale. So these are five inputs, right? If your land is actually, you can't go and acquire land as easily or at, at reasonable prices compared to firms that you have to compete with globally, let's say, you know, 10, 20% higher land cost. Your labor is basically, labor reforms have not happened. And so, you know, adjusted for quality of, you know, labor, you're paying 10, 20% more again. If let's say power is, you know, is not available 24 seven, it's not reliable. You know, there may be power cuts, let's say, and you're not getting adequate power. Then again, that cannot, that cannot help. Net, net, if you take into account the opportunity cost, time lost, et cetera, you are actually paying a much higher, you know, cost for, for, for power maybe 20 20% 20, 20 again. Um, if you actually take then, you know, uh, uh, transportation, because the roads are not that great, you know, you, other firms in, firms in other countries are shipping maybe at, you know, in half the time and maybe without any damages, et cetera, because there are no potholes and, you know, things like that. So that adds maybe another 10, 20%, right? And finally, if you basically have created laws in such a way that, you know, firms prefer, prefer to be dwarfs which means they, even despite aging, they continue to be small, then your fixed costs are actually not being spread over a large denominator. If you're a, you know, a firm that has 100 employees versus a firm that has 1,000 employees, the same fixed costs are being spread over a much larger denominator when it's a 1,000 employee firm rather than a 100 employee firm. And the kind of laws that we've had actually has, you know, when a firm reaches 95, it basically, they don't, you know, a promoter wants to create another firm so that he doesn't get, you know, deprived of some of the benefits that get, that you get from being less than 100. That has encouraged this phenomenon of dwarf, dwarfism. Now put all this together. On each of these costs, each of these inputs, the Indian firms basically were, you know, incurring costs that were 15, 20%, at least larger than the, you know, somebody who's actually even the most innovative entrepreneur can reduce through his ideas, can maybe bring his cost down by 20%, 30%. But when you add these up, you're actually, this is amounting to 100% at least, right? So policy, and this is something which is so important, I have to emphasize that our policy has basically not, and this is this is not, we can't put the blame for this on the, on the entrepreneurs. It is about policy, which did not go and work on these, what we economists call factor markets. These are the factors of production labor, land, power, you know, transportation, economies of scale, each of these factors, these are all markets themselves. Like there's a labor market, there's a market for power, there's a market for land. We did not work on actually making these markets competitive at all. 
and so you know our firms have not been competitive and the you know and and this is nobody has an overnight wand you know it's basically which to sort of want to to create overnight magic it is the emphasis has been you know and this is something which i you know uh, uh, took sort of special uh, uh, attention to brought special attention to is you know working on these factors of production cost making them you know um, for instance the labor law reform actually the bill was passed in parliament um, the if you look at infrastructure the emphasis on power is on you know logistics railways trans you know roads etc so that logistics costs go down um the you know uh, um, msme definitions have been changed so that firms can grow bigger um in other words we encourage children that can become giants rather than encouraging dwarfs mm. taxpayer money should go into children you know into investing in children that can become giants um rather than dwarfs and these together actually will really help in you know in encouraging manufacturing so it's a it's it's not something that actually will happen overnight they have it patient work especially from policy makers on each one of these inputs is i think important each one of, the, one of these markets so that you know the cost of that particular input becomes you know as as good as the level that other global firms have that is important now the pli scheme comes in basically as the bridge to this new you know so the the equilibrium that we've had you know this is one where all these costs are actually higher for our firms um and while policy happens you know and these costs are actually reduced through in you know, emphasis on policy we we have to have indian firms actually which will be you know which will be there to do manufacturing right so you know you you can't you have to in policy you can't pretend you know in in academia we can actually so you know the, the bad equilibrium to good equilibrium you actually write it in a paper done but in the real world you actually have to create that bridge from the bad equilibrium to the good equilibrium and that is what the pli scheme really is and and this is something that is actually you know policy makers have to understand have to realize that if you did not have the pli scheme by the time the good equilibrium comes where our costs are all lower if there aren't enough firms to actually domestic firms you know where will the jobs get created hmm got it cool uh is this what china had done right in the yeah. last 30 40 years yes very much like, in fact you know in fact china not only did it you know make these each of these inputs at the same level through state driven capitalism they would also give sort of implicit subsidies as well so that the cost for chinese firms on these factors of production were actually lower than you know than 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 global firms um and they of course utilize the fact that they had a, they had you know huge demographic dividend when they in the 1980s huge labor force right and so labor costs were lower they used that to you know to really enable manufacturing okay. not just china in fact actually any and this a, a chapter that we had written in the economic survey, 2019-20 economic survey if you look at any firm you know or, or look at any country that has become an export powerhouse or become a manufacturing powerhouse they, you know they've become that by first actually learning to assemble stuff and then moving into more value added i'll give you an example from more, india itself more value added i'll, I'll explain that okay. i'll explain that so if you take you know maruti in india right in the 1980s late 1980s maruti set up shop but it was a joint venture with suzuki so what would happen all the components you know uh, would come in um, they would be imported and they would be assembled you know in 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 india it was only assembly so the maruti car that initially came out was all the components were actually manufactured in you know in in japan and they were just shipped in here and it was assembled here if you're just doing the assembling then you're not adding as much value that's why i meant the value added in contrast if you are manufacturing those components as well then obviously you are actually you know you are sort of creating more value in india itself now this happened in the 1980s when we were only assembling the cars then but since then the entire ancillary sector you know the entire industry for manufacture of components all that has developed and that is how countries move as well you don't learn to actually run before learning to walk and in the you know in the context of export powerhouse manufacturing this assembly is that learning to walk you know and then 
backward integration, which is basically doing more value added is the running part. You know, we have to actually, it's at that territory, every country, Japan, China, you know, we showed that through very, very robust evidence as well. Every country has navigated this path, first starting with assembling and then going into value added. Um, so some of the criticism that comes actually on this that, oh, you know, assembling is basically PLI scheme is being given, let's say for given for electronics assembly. You know, that is something that's a sine qua non. It's essential, you know, to be able to then move into, you know, uh, um, to, to, to value added manufacturing of components as well. It's not as if you have a magic wand and say, today we will manufacturing, you know, electronics end to end. That capability for that doesn't get built unless you've learned how to do the assembly. You know, these are all things that are actually part of practical policy mm -hmm. making. And the final rung in that value add uh, conversation is probably building your own brands. Absolutely. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you said it. You know, this is, I think that's, that's a very, very important part because brands actually, you know, when you look at that, that's where the maximum value comes from. Like um, Germany's it, done it very well. Yes. Intellectual property, right. Um, in gives you, you know, you get the rewards from intellectual property. Um, if you look at, for instance, you know, and there's something as a, as a finance scholar, I look at, if you look at, let's say the, what is called the market to book ratio of a company. Right. Um, if you look at the, you know, take a, take a company like, let's say, you know, Google or, you know, Apple or any of these companies, right? Their physical assets are not that many. Their market value compared to the book value on the balance sheet is, you know, much higher. Where is that coming from? That is coming from the brand that they've built. And, and that is the last step. You absolutely got it right. That having first you know, learn to run, you know, uh, sorry, for having first learned to walk, then learn to run. The branding part is a sprinting part, mm. you know, where you can sprint and start winning the sprint races. As well. Realistically, are we 10 years away from that? Where we'll see a huge number of brands, international brands come out of India and then actually help the Indian GDP. So, you know, the, the, generally, um, so making a prediction about the future is very hazardous. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, with, with that caveat, I would say um, 10 years is a, is a very reasonable frame. If you're able to, if, if 10 years later, you know, Indian brands are known in the advanced economies, then I'd be very glad. Mm. For instance, you know, today here, you know, in, um, in India, everybody knows, you know, Samsung, everybody knows, let's say Hitachi, you know, um, it's a company like if similarly, let's say, you know, maybe uh, an Indian brand is known in, you know, um, and I'm not taking examples just so that, you know, I'd, I'm, people don't perceive me to be biased to one or the other, just any brand, any Indian brand, actually, I'm, you know, as long as it is an Indian brand that actually can go and become big in the world, you know, great for India. Beer biceps steel. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Beer steel. Yeah. Why not? Or biceps steel, you know. Why not? As strong as your biceps. Why not? See, I'll, I'll be so very... I'll give you a, ta a tagline for the ad as well when you create, you know, a bicep steel as strong as Ranvi's biceps. <laughs> steel that is that. You know, I'm, I'm always in for the beer biceps validation. <laughs> That's all I'll say. But I'll, I'll be very raw here with you, sir. Uh, breaking away from this economics conversation. I've had so many government officials on the show, people who are associated with the government, politicians. Everyone points Indian youth towards this manufacturing domain mm -hmm. because I'm understanding that it directly helps you guys in terms of your goals. Yeah. And the government's goal is to make India prosperous. Correct. So if an Indian person wants to help make the country more prosperous, yeah. probably manufacturing is one of a very nice opportunity yes. to kind yes. of uh, grow. Yes. Um, yes. And in particular to actually create jobs for our youth. Yeah. You know, it is incredibly important. It's a self-actualizing job to have as yes. a manufacturing based entrepreneur yes. because you're helping your country, you're helping yourself, you're yes. doing good in the world. Correct. Uh, I'm so tempted. I'm, I'm not even, I'm not saying this as a joke, but yeah. there's a part of me that's tempted to stop podcasting and get into manufacturing of some sort because yeah. of just how much I know about this. Yeah. The yeah. least I can do if I don't get into manufacturing myself is have people from the Correct. audience actually get into it Correct. and then do what I dreamt of doing, but I'm going to be stuck <laughs> here doing podcasts all my life. No, no, I'm kidding. I love this. But let me add one, you know, one aspect to this. Sure. Me, on the See, you know, um, uh, there was this famous Nobel laureate called Milton Friedman um, who came up with 
you know, and I'm just trying to explain manufacturing using. Sure. So he has this uh, hypothesis um, that is called the permanent income hypothesis. This is jargon for actually what I what is something which is a very simple idea, which is that you know, our consumption, any individual's consumption or a household's consumption, is dependent on what we expect our level of permanent income to be. You know, an, an example of this is, suppose you get a promotion, right? Um, when you get a promotion, you expect now your permanent income to be higher than what it was before the promotion. And so you may go and buy a bigger car or you may actually buy a bigger house. Maybe it's not a bigger house, maybe actually from Versova, maybe you might go to, you know, you know South Mumbai, for instance, right? Um, and that's just increasing consumption. So consumption at the level of an individual household or an individual depends on what they think their permanent income is going to be in future. Now, here's where the role of manufacturing comes in because when you have a job in the organized sector, right? Um, you know, you unless you goof up really badly, right? You're going to have that job for maybe the next 20, 25, 30 years. And, you know, a, a steady stream of income is going to come every month then you don't have uncertainty about, you know, what is what are you going to earn next month? Mm. Um, and that then enables you to plan your consumption and increase this consumption. That's what Milton Friedman, you know, said. And when you take that and apply it to the, you know, to the, to the context of manufacturing, when manufacturing basically really picks up and it started picking up already and, you know, but we have to do more on this, uh, the jobs will create it, can get created in large numbers. Um, People who have jobs, because in jobs in the organized sector, in organized manufacturing, they'll know they actually have a certain permanent income. Using that, they'll actually go and spend more money. Demand will go up in the economy. Anticipating that such demand increases, you know, firms will invest more. You could do your, you know, bicep steel, for <laughs> instance, um, and, and others. And, and that's how the virtuous cycle, you know, which really drives economic growth, you know, moves fast. So if manufacturing takes off as a sector, it's a catalyst for general economic I, so growth. So let me, you know, let's be a quote, sort of misquoted here. I don't think we should say if, you know, it's actually, it's already started moving um, when it really sort of, uh, um, you know, we end sort of finish the, the entire stage of, you know, all the stuff that has to be done on manufacturing, then, you know, lots of jobs would get created and all the stuff that I'm talking about. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure you check out this playlist for more videos just like this. It's the Artist Clips.